Hello, welcome to the Wednesday, August 17th, 2022 edition of the Sands and its Storm Center's Stormcast. My name is Johannes Ulrich, and today I'm recording from Jacksonville, Florida. Today we got yet another great post by Didier walking us through the analysis of a malicious office document. Didier uses his tool OliDump for the initial analysis to extract the visual basic for applications code, but well, as so often the code was heavily obfuscated. As part of the obfuscation, the script calls multibyte to white char, a function that allows conversion of bytes into characters by specifying an encoding. Now, typically you would find something like UTF-8 or UTF-16, but not so. Here the attacker actually picked the rather ancient UTF-7. Back in the day, I remember this encoding sometimes led to the bypass of some cross-site scripting filters, but here UTF-7 is just used to fool anti-malware tools to ignore and not being able to really figure out what's happening here. Well, not so, of course, with the help of Didier. Didier isn't fooled so easily and he'll walk you through decoding these scripts. The output is binary code followed by some assembly source code, which actually doesn't really make sense. And Didier guesses that the assembly source code was just left by mistake. Now, the shell code Didier was able to analyze as 64-bit code, and that finally revealed then a URL that may be used to load additional code. So, pretty thorough walkthrough here of some interesting and somewhat unusual sample. And Microsoft recently went after a threat group that they're calling Cyborgium, and that is likely aligned with Russian interests. Of course, Microsoft always uses the name of certain elements to identify different threat groups. Like so many advanced persistent threat campaigns, this one also takes advantage of phishing and then, of course, breaches organizations typically here to leak data. This is one of those groups that will go after individuals, will uh, go after organizations. They mention NATO here as an example and uh, many other organizations are targeted here. They leak information typically sort of to shape the narrative as Microsoft uh, put it or basically in some cases maybe discredit uh, these particular individuals. Of course, the real interesting part of these write-ups is always uh, the different techniques and such that these adversaries are using. Microsoft uh, talks about how they, for example, use LinkedIn accounts in order to collect open source intelligence on their targets. They will also set up email addresses uh, with free email providers impersonating certain individuals. And then they start sending some emails, first some harmless, friendly messages, just sort of to establish a conversation and a little bit of rapport with the victim uh, before they are then sending some weaponized email. Microsoft's blog includes many samples and additional details to help you identify possible intrusions by this group. What I always find interesting here is when they're listing the domains that were used as part of the campaign. Of course, those domains are no longer really being used, but sort of the benign nature of these domains, uh, how they sort of fit in uh, with uh, domains that you typically would expect. I think uh, including some of those domain names uh, may make a good uh, lesson for an awareness program just to tell users that, well, you know, uh, the bad guys don't always use evilexample.com. Over the last few years, ultra wideband real time location uh, systems or locator systems have become more and more common. They use the industrial equipment, some of these sort of smart cities they are being used, and even sort of Apple's uh, Find My uh, system kind of fits into that uh, category. Now, for these systems, when they're sort of used on a larger scale, they typically have location anchors. They're receiving the signals uh, from uh, these uh, devices, from the tags that are sending basically radio signals. And then these location anchors, uh, they are then connecting back to some kind of central server, either via Wi-Fi or via Ethernet. And of course, because these are often sort of uh, distributed systems across a larger area, Wi-Fi is quite common. 
So researchers at Nozomi uh, looked into the Savoy indoor tracking system and the Avalu Reni, if I pronounce that correctly, Artemis Enterprise system. And they particularly looked at the Wi-Fi communication here. Not so much at the communication from the tag to the anchor that has been discussed uh, in the past, as they're saying, but really sort of how is that information then hauled back to the server. And what they found here is it uses an unencrypted binary protocol that wasn't really so hard uh, to decode. And with that, an attacker would be able to spoof the location, evade some of these uh, safe areas and uh, geofencing that is implemented in these systems that keep, for example, equipment out of hazard zones or alert users if they enter one. And then, of course, they would also be able to spoof the location of certain equipment or individuals, in addition, of course, to also figuring out what the location is in the first place. As so often, the advice is here to limit access to the network used to send these messages. Well, and that's it for today. Thanks for listening and talk to you again tomorrow.